Well, Anand, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I have to say I feel terribly underdressed up here next to all of you, but it is great to be here nonetheless. Ernst & Young and the Smith School have enjoyed a very, very long relationship. It's been a really remarkable partnership for the last 30 years. I can tell you it's been spectacular for our firm. I'm told it's been great for the school, and from me, just know that this will continue for at least another 30 years. It's a special honor to be invited to speak here today, but I have to admit something. When I started thinking about what I was going to talk about, you know, I was hitting this mental block. And so I called the dean, and I said, Dean, what do you think I should talk about? And there's this silence on the other end of the phone, and, and finally he says, well, just talk about 15 minutes or so. And so <laughs> I hope he was more help to you than he was to me, in all honesty. Uh, seriously, though, as I was thinking about what I wanted to say today, I thought what I'd try to do is weave together a few things, some thoughts around timing, some thoughts around the spotlight and the importance of a spotlight, some thoughts about the world that each of you are entering into, and maybe a few thoughts on how to win in that world. Um, to put it bluntly, today is really a great milestone for all of you, and I'd like to congratulate you. People sometimes say, though, that timing is everything, and I think they've got that about right. For me, in some ways, when I think about your milestone, I think about my last milestone, and, and as the dean says, it was over 10 years ago when I was asked to lead Ernst & Young. Many of you are familiar with Ernst & Young. Today, we are approaching 150,000 people, way over $20 billion in revenue. We were about half that then, and timing, though, is really important. The dean and I were speaking earlier today. He was asked to lead the Smith School right at the beginning of the financial crisis. His timing was just ideal. I was asked to lead Ernst & Young when we were in the middle of a deep recession as well. You know, it sounds familiar. We're in the middle of one or just recovering from one now. A couple of months after I took the reins at Ernst & Young, September 11, 2001 occurred. And then the Enron scandal hit and our profession came under attack. I remember at that time hosting these web-enabled conference calls with all of our partners and trying to explain what the world was going through. And I remember this one partner emailing me in a question. She said something like, Jim, you've led the firm for almost six months now, and in that time, we've seen the deepest recession in years, we've seen war declared on our country September 11th, and now war declared on our profession. My question is, are you having fun yet? And so, I was pleased to hear her question. I thought I was gonna get blamed for all this stuff. But anyhow, since that time, Ernst & Young, the business world in general, have all experienced many, many challenges. Obviously, most recently, the 2008 financial crisis and the resulting recession. And along the way, I think it's fair to say that the business world in general, my profession for sure, and certainly my firm, have all gone through a lot of change. We've taken an awful lot of shots, shots that, frankly, we deserved. But I'm happy to say that both our profession and our firm have come through the turmoil stronger, have come through the turmoil more focused than we were going in. We learned a lot of lessons through the tough times. We learned, very importantly, about the dangers of being arrogant. We learned about the importance of listening to a much wider cross-section of people than we'd ever listened to before. But we also learned something else that was very important. We learned that the spotlight is always on. Before, we had been a pretty dull profession, boring accountants, you know, it's almost a stereotype. But since that time, we've been scrutinized like never before. We've been scrutinized by the media, by our regulators, frankly, by everybody. And it's sort of interesting, there are those in our profession, frankly, there are those in any business that actually chafe at this kind of scrutiny. I have to tell you, though, I have a different view. I've lived it both ways as sort of the boring, under-the-radar screen accountants and getting a lot of scrutiny. And I would much rather be both heavily scrutinized and very relevant than neither. So a lot has changed, not just in our profession, but in the environment overall. The times that we've all been living through have been very turbulent. They continue to be. They're very much game-changing times. I think they're game-changing for companies. 
I think they're game-changing for individuals like you. They're game-changing even for countries. There's going to be winners, there's going to be losers during game-changing times like this. And from my vantage point, there's really just a couple of ways to win during times like this. Maybe, just maybe, one or more of you out there who are graduates have the kind of brain to help invent the iPad 3. Who knows what's coming next? Frankly, for the rest of us, it's going to boil down to just really great on the ground execution. To put in practice, to deploy all of the things that these professors at Smith have taught you. But to execute well, a company or an individual, or frankly even a country, I think really have to go into it with the right mindset. When the financial crisis hit, it was remarkable how most companies around the world reacted. They turned inward. They sort of hunkered down. They worried a lot more about what they had to lose than what they had to gain. They worried about protecting their assets. We did a survey at Ernst & Young during the depths of the crisis. We asked the same battery of questions to just scores of mature multinationals and also more entrepreneurial businesses. The results were truly amazing. As I remember it, less than one in five, 19% to be precise, of the mature multinationals in the depths of the crisis were seeking opportunities. One in five. Same period of time, same questions, fully two-thirds, 67% of the entrepreneurial companies said they were being aggressive. Can we take over our weaker competitors? Should we roll up an industry? Should we go into new markets? The mindset of the entrepreneurs, and you've talked about this a lot here at Smith, is just different. They don't think about themselves first. They think about the world outside themselves. They see the needs that exist in the marketplace out there. They all have a vision to create an idea, a product, a service, a solution to meet the need that exists. They've got an amazing amount of courage to risk everything, to go chase their dream. And then all these entrepreneurs have something that is not recognized often, and that is a persistence to pick themselves up, dust themselves off when things don't go well the first time, because most highly successful entrepreneurs fail the first time out. And so I know you've had this drilled into you, but get that entrepreneur's mindset on the world, and it's going to serve you well. But mindset alone won't get it done. I think it's really important that everyone have a real clear understanding of the landscape that's out there. Now, from my perspective, there are a couple of really big shifts, big trends that are going to drive things for the next couple of decades. There's the shift in capital from the west to the east, north to the south, developed to emerging markets, and the demographic shifts around gender, ethnicity, nationality, religion, sexual orientation, age, lots of differences. My guess is you've spent a lot of time studying the capital shifts and the impact on economies, the impact on companies, the impact on countries, but few people have spent enough time really, really thinking about the demographic issues and the impact they're going to have. So I want to say a few words about that. I saw some stats a few months ago that shocked even me. I spent a lot of time thinking about demographics, and these stats even surprised me. It dealt with the average age of populations in different parts of the world. If you go out just nine years from today, 2020, the average age of the population in the United States and in China will be about the same, 36 or 37 years old. No real shock there. The average age in Western Europe and Japan will be about the same, 46 or 47 years old, a full 10 years older. The average age in the Middle East and India will also be about the same, 26 or 27 years old, a full generation younger than Western Europe. Think for a second about the impact this 20-year gap has on everything, on education policy, on consumer spending, on the ability of anybody, any society, to be able to actually pay for the social contracts they have got in place on immigration policy. It impacts absolutely everything. I also want to share quickly 
a couple slides I saw a decade ago that stick with me every day. I carry it in my pocket every day because I don't want to forget it. What this is, is it's a summary of what the world would look like if the entire population of the world, six plus billion people, were boiled down to 100 people. What would it look like? Showed the first 52 women, 42 men, or 48 men, no real surprise. 30 people of the 100 would be white, 70 people would be non-white. Little surprise there, perhaps, for many. 30 would be Christian, 70 non-Christian, 85% or so heterosexual, 15% homosexual, 57 Asians, 21 Europeans, 14 from the Americas, 8 from Africa. No real surprises there. The surprises came in the next slide. If the whole world was condensed to 100 people, six people would control 60% of the wealth of the entire world. Six people. 80 people out of 100 would live in substandard housing. 70 people would be unable to read, even in their own native language. 50 people would suffer from malnutrition. And a grand total of one or two people out of 100 would have a higher education. So if you think about the diversity of your class, if you think about how your class in some ways represents the world around you, frankly, in many other ways, it doesn't. These stats, I think all demographics, are going to have an amazingly big impact on companies, on careers, on countries. It's vitally important to think about this. The fact is, the teams that each of you will be on in the future, the next couple of decades, will be much more diverse than the teams you've been on in the past. That's a fact. The scary truth is that really diverse teams rarely, if ever, perform in the middle of the road. They're either great, off the charts great, or they're awful. It comes down to the culture that you will build in that team. Are the opinions of others sought out and welcomed? Are the differences around the table respected? Does the team trust each other? If the answer to these questions is no, then your team's going to fail. If the answer to this is yes, then there's going to be the magic of innovation. It's going to be great. The strength of any really diverse organization is, is not just having people who look different, act different, live different. It's having people who think differently. And in that process, getting better solutions and better outcomes. So I urge you, wherever you end up going to work, Find a company that thinks about this landscape that I've been talking about, that recognizes the importance of it. If you can't find a company that thinks that way, then go out and build a company on your own, and you'll be very, very happy. Well, as I said at the outset, that timing is everything. Yeah, you're graduating at a great time. We are seeing growth come back. Because of this landscape, it's not consistent growth. It's very inconsistent. We're living in a love recovery, not L-O-V-E, but it's L-U-V. L-shaped in Western Europe, certainly in Japan, U-shaped in the U.S. and Canada, V-shaped recovery in the rest of the world. It's going to be that way today. Frankly, it's going to be that way for the foreseeable future. Today, though, is really about you. You, you all have every right to be proud, and you should be proud of what you've done. I hope you also are very grateful for the opportunities that your families have provided you, that the school has provided you. In a few minutes, you're all going to be walking right up here on this stage. You're going to be walking underneath this spotlight. And then you're going to walk off the stage. And I just hope that you remember the spotlight is not going to be off of you once you walk down the steps. It is always going to be on you. It's going to show things that you are strong in. It's going to show things you are weak in. It's going to show things you should be proud of and your family should be proud of. And it may show things that you would be ashamed of. And so just remember that the spotlight will always be on you. You've got lots of choices to make. As much has been given to you, you've got lots of choices. Make the right decisions, and the decisions you make will always make those around you, the loved ones here who came to celebrate with you, proud. It will also ensure that you have a very, very positive impact on all the people you touch as years go on, on the companies that you touch, on the communities in which you live. With that, let me just thank you and congratulate you and wish you all the very, very best of luck. Great to be with you.